Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. My name is Stan and in this video, I wanna take a look at the cooler I've got right here. This is the Noctua NH-D15S Chromax Black. Uh, this cooler is something I'm gonna be using with my upcoming build and uh, in this video, we're gonna be taking a look at the cooler itself, installing it, and then taking a look at some benchmarks or see the performance figures with how it pairs up with a 5800X Ryzen CPU. I'm not gonna lie, when this thing arrived, I was blown away at how big of a container or box this, uh, this packaging is. Uh, you know, clearly this is gonna be a very big CPU cooler, and if you're familiar with air coolers that you've clearly heard not do a coolers before, the NHD14, the NHD15, those coolers have been around forever, but this one, however, this one being the D15S, Chromax Black, so there's a couple unique things about this cooler. So the first is that it's a D15S, so that there's only one single fan. This single fan is a 140 millimeter fan right in between, uh, situated right in between the heat sinks. And the second point is that it is a Chromax Black. A couple years back, Noctua finally relented and launched the Chromax Black lineup, which blacked out the fans. And with this cooler here, the Chromax Black, you've got a black cooler with a black fan, so it looks really, really good. If you were sitting on the fence because of Noctua coloring and uh, the design language and it just didn't match your system, well, this one is for you because this thing looks awesome. Now I'll make sure to link this in the description down below for your convenience for you guys to check out the prices. And if you do decide to buy it, you can always use the link and it will help out this channel. In terms of compatibility, this cooler is compatible with virtually most of the platforms out there. And going back a handful of years because it's compatible with all of the LGA 11 5X, which uh, from the Intel platform, which includes the 1150, 1151, 1155, 1156. It's compatible with the 1200 and even the newest Alder Lake 1700 family. Uh, all you need is a adapter plate to be able to uh, get this cooler compatible. Now, if you buy this on Amazon, uh, if you select the one with the compatibility with 1700, you also get this package as well. The price is almost the same, and I do think you can get this for free or for a very little cost on Noctua's website if you choose to need something for Alder Lake. Uh, on the AMD side, it's, it goes way back as well. AM2, AM2+, AM3, AM3+, AM4, FM1, FM2, FM2+. Uh, uh, of course, you might need some additional equipment uh, for, for the back, back plate or whatever, and you can also pick those up on Noctua. The only thing that isn't compatible uh, from what it looks like here is the TRX system for a Threadripper. Those are so big that I think these are just, this one specifically is just not designed for it. There are other uh, TRX 40 compatible air coolers from Noctua, so be sure to check that out if you do have a Threadripper. In terms of what you get in the box, you get the heat sink, you get the mounting brackets, you get the screws, and you also get a little screwdriver, L-shaped screwdriver, that's perfect for reaching the screws on this cooler. More on that later when we install it. You also get a tube of NTH1, which is Noctua's a very good thermal compound. And inside the box, you also get a low noise adapter. Those are the adapters with a little bit extra resistance to slow your fans down. The default uh, fan speed for the 140 millimeter fan is anywhere from 300 RPMs all the way to 1500 RPMs, plus or minus 10%, according to the literature here. But with the low noise adapter, you drop that from uh, 1500 down to 1200. So 1200 is a very bearable, very easy to work with maximum speed. So if you're looking for something quiet and you can't control it on the motherboard or the fan controller side, you can certainly use that low noise adapter to get that fan speed down. Taking the heatsink out of the box, you're greeted with this chunky heatsink and you've, it's got six thick heat pipes connected to the bottom of the base. And if you take a look at the base itself, it's a very shiny, nice mirror finish. 
and the quality of the heatsink just feels extremely premium. The fan it feels very sturdy and the build quality and the welding of everything also feels very good. Inside the secondary box, you've got all of the mounting equipment and all of the different brackets. Now, word of caution here, please do actually read the manual and figure out which pieces of equipment and mounting hardware you need, depending on your platform. I know we tend to like to skip the manual or skip the quick start guide, but this is actually pretty important because there's so many pieces that look very similar. Uh, and it really makes a difference which one you use for which platform you've got. For the mounting experience, if you use a Noctua in the past, you kind of know uh, the gist of it and the way it mounts. But if you haven't, believe me, this is probably one of the best mounting systems you can, you can use for CPUs. It's really easy to put on and, and really easy to take off. You got a couple brackets and you got a couple spacers where you screwed down the bracket and then from there, you install your CPU, or if you've already installed your CPU, you know, put the thermal paste on, and then you could seat the entire heatsink onto that, put it into place, and then you screw down the screws using the included tool. Now, the included tool is a very nice long uh, screwdriver. The screwdriver is a metal rod with a Phillips head on one of the ends, and this is actually a lot better than probably your screwdriver because your screwdriver is is probably too thick or, or bulky to get it into this tight space where you need to uh, screw down the screw. And also the screw on the heatsink is, is integrated so it'll never come out. You just plop it down, screw the two screws in and all the way to the bottom and it's spring tension so it's the perfect tension. This mounting experience is super simple. I really wish all coolers used this design or have something similar to it because there are so many good things about this mounting system. Now, in terms of fitment, I've got a Crosshair Impact Mini ITX board. Uh, this board has a M.2 riser situated right in between the GPU slot and the cooler. Uh, this was not an issue with this uh, CPU cooler. It cleared it just fine. And the memory that I have is the Dominator, Corsair Dominator Platinums. They also cleared this cooler just fine. In fact, there's probably another two centimeters of space between the cooler and the memory. So if you have something even taller than a Dominator Platinum, then you're still probably okay. On the other side, the IO shield side, the Crosshair Impact has this thick aluminum chunky IO shield that also cleared the cooler just fine. Clearance wasn't an issue basically. So. Uh, I'm, my guess is whatever board you've got, you're probably okay with this cooler. It's always good to check uh, for compatibility. Noctua's website does have a pretty good configurator to take a look at what board you've got, what cooler you want to take a look at, and even what CPU is supported by this cooler and, and the expected performance. So uh, do your research and that way you have no surprises. But again, I think this one is compatible with most hardware out there. Once installed, this cooler looks immaculate. You've got a single 140 millimeter fan sitting in between the two fan towers doing push and pull. And in my experience, I think one fan is plenty. If you do want to have that second fan, you can install a second fan and clip it on. I don't think it's necessary. I think it actually looks better with just the one fan and all of the aluminum black fins exposed. It looks really good. From here, we'll take a look at some of the performance and what you can expect using this cooler with something like a eight core 5800X Ryzen CPU. Now, the first application we're looking at here is Cinebench. And the reason why we're using Cinebench is because it's one of the more intensive uh, benchmarking applications that you can use onto the CPU and it will properly heat up the CPU to the worst case scenario temperature, basically. I've also got a bunch of other applications on the screen for you to see the, uh, the stats here. And from this right, what you can see is we're running at an all core frequency of 4.5 gigahertz. Uh, in the BIOS, all I have done is set everything to auto, enabled PBO, and set the offset for PBO at a plus 200 megahertz. So I didn't touch any of the uh, voltages, didn't touch anything else. Everything is basically auto. And uh, this is a pretty set it and forget it uh, setting that a lot of you guys can achieve on a 5800X. 
Now, 4.5 gigahertz on all cores, and you can see we're doing a core voltage under load of 1.32 volts. So uh, you can use these as a guide of kind of where this chip stands. Uh, what you can see is we're running at a constant uh, 1245, almost 1250 RPMs on the CPU cooler. And we're sitting at a uh, average temperature of 82-83 degrees Celsius. Again, 4.5 gigahertz. And we can see that we're pulling about 110 watts of power. Now, the reason why we're sitting at the 82, 83 degrees Celsius is because this is kind of a PBO defined top limit. It usually doesn't go much higher than the low 80s when you're running PBO. And with that as a temperature ceiling, it starts to adjust clock speed. So we're sitting at a solid 4.5 gigahertz on all cores, which is pretty respectable for uh, what you can expect out of a 5800X, or Zen 3 for that matter. Uh, with all this said here, 83 degrees, 4.5 gigahertz, 110 watts, kind of proves that this cooler is able to properly cool the CPU under this kind of load while still doing it at a very quiet fan speed. At 1250 RPMs, you can hear the fan a little bit as this thing ramps up, there is a pretty good amount of airflow going through the cooler, but at the same time, it is not extremely loud or it's not annoying uh, by any means. While I've got everything running in the background, I'll just bring the microphone up to the fan here for you guys to listen. Now that was about what, three, four inches away from the fan. I'm currently running an open air setup, so uh, I'm sitting about two feet, maybe th three feet away from this computers. Uh, this is gonna be probably the worst case scenario with this cooler in an open air situation in terms of noise, but you know, hopefully you can hear that it really isn't all that bad of a fan noise. Now, one caveat I wanna point out is that I currently have the BIOS fan profile set to quiet mode, so uh, even though the fan has a full range of 300 RPM all the way up to 1500 RPM, it's currently topping out about 1250. And as you can see, the, the temperatures are perfectly fine for that profile. If I were to crank it up to 1500, uh, I might lose another one or two degrees on the CPU and or gain maybe another 25 megahertz or 50 megahertz. But honestly, personally, I don't think it's worth it. That's why I've currently set it to uh, quiet and while it's an idle it ramps all the way down to about 600 rpm so 600 rpms on this fan is virtually silent even in an open air case so uh, all that said i think this is a very good cooler uh, even with the settings that i've got right now the next test i've got here is to take a look at how the cooler responds to gaming type loads uh, I've got Final Fantasy XIV running in the background here, and the reason why we're using this is because it's a relatively well-threaded MMO game, and generally MMO games have a lot of threads and are relatively CPU uh, intensive. Even though I've only got an RTX 3060 here, you can see I'm pulling over 100 frames at standard settings, and I'm pulling, maxing out two cores here and loading up several other cores. So. Uh, the actual CPU speed is anywhere from 4.7 to up to upwards to 4.8 gigahertz. And uh, the temperature is sitting at about 60, or no, that's the GPU. The temperature, temperature for the CPU is sitting at 64 to 62 degrees Celsius. Generally in games, that's kind of what I've been seeing is the mid 60s for gaming loads. And what's more important is the CPU fan is only running at about 800 RPMs. The noise that I'm hearing is really primarily from the GPU fans running at 1700 RPMs, but the CPU fan is very quiet. Uh, in fact, it's probably silent at this point. 800 RPMs is, is really, really slow for a CPU fan. So in more real world scenarios, the performance is more than adequate. All right, even in the latest AAA titles, such as Halo Infinite, you can see that we're running at 55 degrees Celsius with a fan speed of about 760 some RPMs. 
And this is primarily because the CPU load is uh, about 24 or 25%. And it's a little bit lower than what we were seeing in Final Fantasy, primarily probably because the GPU just can't keep up all that much uh, with the game only putting 45 FPS or so. But uh, you can see the CPU again clocking the 4.7, 4.8 gigahertz. So the CPU cooler is clearly doing its job. Now let me try to summarize this CPU cooler. If you got a medium power to even a high powered CPU, such as a 5800X or 5900X CPU, uh, this cooler is gonna be able to cool that no problem. If you do have something a little bit more powerful, like a 5900, 5950X or an Alder Lake CPU, those do tend to run a little bit hot. Uh, if you're talking about TDP, the Ryzen CPUs are gonna be about 100 to 150 TDP. The uh, Alder Lake ones are probably pushing 240, maybe 300 if you truly overclock it. So that's where, that's where, you know, that's where you might wanna go with an AIO. But if you're in that 100, 150, under 200 TDP point, uh, even my guess the 5950X is probably okay. But this cooler is gonna be able to cool that no problem and run PBO on top of that. Again, in my test, I showed PBO because I think that's really where you should be running your CPUs. If you didn't have PBO enabled, you're probably gonna be sitting at a maximum temperature of like 70 degrees uh, because they do run very cool. The, the Ryzen CPUs run really cool baseline. Um, now, PBO, PBO will it'll never overheat the CPU anyway because there are thermal limits and it'll kind of throttle back. But you can see a 4.5 gigahertz all core overclock uh, or PBO overclock uh, is very respectable and is, is pretty good on a CPU like this. So I do think that this cooler is going to be a very good alternative to some of those entry level AIO cooler, such as like the H100 or H110, you know, the 120 uh, millimeter AIO coolers. This thing is gonna be on par, if not a little bit better than some of the cheaper ones. This isn't gonna be beating those 360 millimeter AIOs. It's not meant to be, it's cheaper, it's less maintenance, but I do think that there is a very good compelling argument to go air cooling for something like this um, than, than always going to that AIO water cooling setup. If you like this video, make sure to give this video a thumbs up. And if you want to see more content like this, you can always subscribe. As always, my name is Stan and I'll see you guys in the next one.